you and I are at a unique juncture in history. By many measures, lifespan, infant mortality, literacy, violent crime rates and so on, the world is getting better. But we never hear about this on the news. There's a gulf between what you see on TV and what the data tells us. These positive changes are largely driven by the fact we are experiencing technological changes on a par with the Industrial Revolution. Automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of these things are changing the world in dramatic and irreversible ways. And the rate of change is accelerating. The internet has only been around in recognisable form for about two decades. In two decades from now, aspects of our world will be unrecognisable. The way we interact, the way we cooperate and the way we work. But we're not keeping up. We're reshaping our societies without even realising we're doing it, and we're in danger of leaving some people behind. I'm long on optimism for the next 50 years, but I'm short on it for the coming 10. Technology is overtaking us, and at the same time, the gap between labour and capital has never been starker. At the end of the animation, I'm going to explain five concrete steps we're taking in my business to reverse this trend. I want to work with other business owners to expand these and to make them the norm. We need to reimagine the role of business in society and our cultural system and how tech impacts this. We need to do some serious thinking about the world we want to build, who it's for and how we get there. Let me give you a number. 13. 13%. That's how many people in the state say they're actually satisfied with their work. It's not much, is it? In fact, it's incredibly low. 87% are not happy in their job. And that's hardly a glowing endorsement of the last 100 years of capitalism. The idea of capitalism with a social heart has had some pretty bad press in the last few years, but it's clear that neoliberalism has failed. I'm confident that there's no shame in making money, but we have to recognise that there is a moral dimension both to how it's accumulated and how it's spent. The promise of capitalism, supposedly, was that we should be able not only to meet our immediate needs, but also to fulfil our desires. That 13% is pretty clear evidence that that hasn't happened. You probably know about the Maslow Pyramid. At the bottom are immediate concerns of our physiological needs, then safety, then security, which for a reasonable chunk of the population we're pretty good at delivering. But we should be more interested in what happens at the top. The final piece of the pyramid is about self actualization about arriving at the best possible version of ourselves. The idea is that we achieve that when our other needs have been met. That's where I want us all to get. Let's go back to those technological changes. We're now living through a fantastically important time. Robotics have already revolutionised production, and soon those technologies will enter our homes. Virtual and augmented reality are going to open up entirely new fields of arts and culture. Virtual reality developers are literally building an entirely new medium. And artificial intelligence is changing our world already. But the uptick here is going to be sudden and huge. In a few years, due to the advances in quantum computing, Siri on your iPhone is going to look like space invaders. It's easy to take this for granted. If you're below the age of about 35, you're used to advances virtually every week that for me, a man in <clears throat> middle age from Grimsby, could barely have ever imagined. But this isn't business as usual. It's not just another chapter. Look a bit deeper and it's easy to see that the advances we're making are going to signal a major upheaval in the way we structure society. In the last two years, the world created 90% of all the data that's ever been recorded in human history. Everywhere we go, with every browser window we open, with every contactless payment we make, we're leaving a data footprint. Data isn't good or bad. You can't ascribe a moral value to a zero or a one. But at the minute, data also isn't really regulated, and mainly because the regulators are at least a decade behind the companies they're meant to be keeping an eye on. And this presents a fundamental question. How do we decide what the data is for and who controls it? Let's think about Uber. We've all used it. It's cheap, it's convenient, and it's handy after a night out. But Uber's medium-term business model isn't about low-paid, non-unionised workers driving cars. It's about getting rid of those workers altogether. Uber acquired a company called Otto, and they're in the haulage business, but they don't employ any truckers. Instead, Otto builds self-driving lorries. The sort of technology they've already built works for people like Rio Tinto, 
who have driven their own self-driving trucks half a million miles on the west coast of Australia without anyone at the wheel. 75% of the logistics cost in haulage go on human labour. So you can see why Rio Tinto are excited. And isn't that great? Lower costs for oil companies mean lower prices at the pump, which means you get to spend less on petrol. But hang on, what happens to all those truckers? Haulage employs 325,000 people in the UK alone, and where are they all going to go? And while we're at it, isn't the cost of petrol a two-year high? Or we could think about call centres. You pick up the phone to talk to your bank, and already you'll probably struggle to speak with a human. But if you get the right number, you end up with someone to answer your question about your debit card you've lost. And there's a company called IPsoft that's replacing those people with an AI called Amelia. It's already happening online. Today, with chatbots, you can ask for recommendations for shoes or cosmetics or broadband packages without ever leaving your Facebook tab. And now we can have functional conversations with that AI. It's like Scarlett Johansson from the movie Her, but it's way more practical. But again, what happens to the people in the bank or the people in the shoe shop? What are they going to do when Uber, Otto and IPsoft eventually win that battle? To be clear, it's not Uber or IPsoft's fault per se. Of course, if it wasn't them, it would be someone else. And if we play our cards right, these technologies could be a net positive over the long term in lowering the cost of goods and, of course, creating new jobs that we haven't even imagined yet. But surely businesses aren't an abstraction from the rest of society. We can harness these technologies for the general good, but we can't do this unless businesses take some responsibility. We all need to work together to think about how we build what Peter Diamandis calls the bridge to a world of abundance. And that's the decision we have to make. If we keep going down the path we're on, the bank workers and the truckers get laid off, and the technologists, CEOs and data company shareholders will become astronomically rich. We've already seen this happen. Today, more capital is concentrated in a smaller number of hands than at any time in history. And at the same time, blue and now white-collar workers are seeing their jobs, their careers, threatened by technology that they don't understand. Can that be right? I'm a businessman. I run a data and technology company in financial services. I'm a committed capitalist. I want to make my shareholders money, but that's only part of what businesses need to do. I'm interested in how we make sure the technological changes we're seeing benefit not just the already rich, but everyone in society. How can we share fairly in the advances in which we've all played a part? In the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes, the economist, saw this coming. He imagined that by now, Automation and the other technology we're talking about could mean a 15-hour work week. We could learn languages, we could write that novel, or just importantly, we could look after our kids or parents. As Simply Business, we're committed to making sure that everyone shares in the benefits of new technology. And why not? Why does this seem like such a silly, naive idea? I think that's because we're not making deliberate enough decisions. As a society, we're still tethered to the ideas of the last 30 years of capitalism but it's very clear that those ideas have failed. We need new ones. We're going to face further and more dramatic disruptions in the coming years, whether it's quantum computing, 5G technology, rapid advances in machine learning, or even global internet coverage. The pace of change we've been talking about is going to increase very rapidly. And these are huge opportunities, but they also present challenges. As I said, I'm a businessman, not a politician. But in small ways, we're trying to play our part in developing those new ideas, starting with our own organisation. I want to share five ideas and I want to work together to expand on them and to embed them into the value system of businesses more generally. These five ideas work for us, but I want to hear from more people to see what works for them in their own businesses. One, in our business, we've rejected Taylorism. We don't think that companies or people are machines that need to be optimised. Instead, we value people over process. We want emotional intelligence, not just IQ. That needs to be replicated in management. Leadership isn't about being the smartest person in the room anymore, if it ever was. It's about asking the right questions and then building an environment in which people are able to answer them. Two, we do something we call building the suit, not the machine. The value of tech is derived from its application and the problem it solves for the end user. So we don't want pure artificial intelligence. What we actually want is intelligence augmented. Taking all the great things that machines are good at and combining them with the things on which humans will always have the upper hand. Three, 
Another fundamental value is the need for equality and participation as standard in every business. A simply business, every single person has an equity stake. And why can't we legislate for that? When a business is sold or recapitalised, why don't the people who actually make the effort get a share too? In the same vein, we're working to move everyone in our service centre to a four-day week by 2020. That extra day will be an investment in those individuals' future and they can use it how they choose. It's an experiment, sure, but it's one I believe in. I think it's time to start taking concrete action. It's time we made the division between labour and capital fairer. Four, find and then live your values. And don't make it about money. It's a cliche, but it really won't buy you happiness. I think one of the worst phrases in the English language is work-life balance. The idea that work is something distinct from the rest of your life makes no sense. Instead, we need to figure out ways to become our best selves in every aspect of our lives. It's the self-actualization at the top of the Maslow Pyramid that I mentioned earlier. Five, finally, and most importantly, I want us to be present and to live deliberately. At the beginning of this animation, we talked about letting technology happen to us rather than making conscious decisions about its impacts. We've let that go on for too long. And when we look back 20 years from now, our addiction to mobile phones will look anachronistic, as much so as our children advertising cigarettes in the 60s, which really happened. Technology isn't good in and of itself. It must be a way of enhancing our humanity. If we're slavishly attached, it diminishes us. Every day we can make small but important choices about technology. For example, I make sure that my mobile is left by the door when I get home, so my time is for my wife and my kids. This is my priority. Everything else is a distant second. Similarly, we don't allow tech in our meetings at work. Our people are free to choose which meetings they attend, but if they do turn up, it's vital that they are truly present. These small choices matter in life, in a life lived more deliberately. I'm a technological optimist and see the possibility of a world of abundance. The disruption we're already seeing, it's only just begun. And we need strategies to react to it and to build that bridge to the future. Let's think more clearly about tech and its impacts, not just for shareholders, but for everyone. These are our ideas that we've learnt from the last 10 years of experimentation and failure. But we want to hear from you as well. New ideas for a new mode of capitalism that shares the benefits with everyone.